Welcome to uh, tonight's Appropriation Committee meeting. Uh, tonight uh, we have uh, first public comment on the agenda and then uh, we're going to be discussing the budget tonight um, in preparation for uh, uh, Thursday's public hearing. Great. And uh, so it's really we will tonight we're up for any debate or discussion on positions. I'm not sure if we want to start taking uh, uh, motions and uh, uh, voting on some of the articles um, I just uh, Ben just gave us a uh, motions document today we can do that tonight start a few tonight or uh, uh, do it Thursday after the public hearing um, it's definitely a lot of quite a few articles so there's some that are just to get out of the way I guess right so there'll be 30 um, articles that the Appropriations Committee will take a position on, and there will be 27 of those that will, the Appropriations Committee will make the motion on. We should hang on to it until the timer. Yeah, that's great. So first on the agenda, um, public comment. Um, we don't believe we have anyone here for public comment. So it's on to the next agenda item. Um, Although, uh, minutes, do we, and do we see any minutes? No. Pass forward. <laughs> okay, so. You will. We don't have any minutes to pass, uh, to vote on. So next is discussion of the budget. Okay, you had talked about several methods for doing this, and one that you had talked about was going through the line by lines that start on page five of this budget but I, I don't know if you have settled as a group on how you want to go through the budget uh, there's a, that a good line by line presentation starts in landscape mode on page five of the package that uh, you all had that April 9th package this thing, okay. it's on the uh, it's on the drive and then will help point us there we've shared that and if we had our naming conventions Next year, we're going to have new naming conventions. We have a lot of documents with similar names. I'm just going to throw up the, it looks like the um, April 9 version is not up there. I'll do that right, right. The April 9 version, so you're going to share that out right now? Yes. So there's a, a fresh resharing of it. On the drive. Okay. Um, you, you should get an email, right, that will tell you it's just been shared with you again. That's coming out now, Ben? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll Isn't technology wonderful. <laughs> I, I think uh, file naming. You know, in the world of Google, this is we're transitioning to Google for the value, and it's a good value. But the file naming really has to be uh, the heart of the whole thing, yeah. right? So, and that's just one idea. I mean, if you have other ideas, the way you'd like to go through it, I mean, there's... Uh, yeah, section by section is not a bad way to do it. Ben, did you sign that yet? Uh, so it is now posted on the Appropriations Committee drive, and I will um, email it out as well. Or could you just use the share button to share it, and it'll pop right up for everybody? Yeah, is that, absolutely. That works, too. Can you send me a, an attachment? Yes, absolutely. Next year, I'm buying you a uh, <laughs> my own laptop, your own town laptop for this responsibility. You can put it in a lead sealed box in your trunk <laughs> so it doesn't <laughs> violate the parking lot rules at your office. People at the marathon wasn't uh, wasn't it was a big of a crowd at the common. It was the weather. It was yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. The rain, yeah. The storming, the light, thunder and lightning. I actually was in Boston. I was volunteering um, downtown, so it's rolled in the rain. <laughs> so I I don't see it on the shared drive. Um, um, 
It's uh, the name of it's four nine. Oh, yeah, four nine. Still in the name. Yeah, it's four nine. <coughs> it's actually it says eighteen, but I'm just gonna. Read Is it four dot nine dot something? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Four dot nine dot eighteen budget package. Uh, yep, yeah. and it, it should be. It, it, it's should 19, be nineteen. So just I just updated that, and I sent it out via email. Just. All right. We used to be able to line for the marathon all the way along the side of the road, right. and now they've kind of condensed the space. Right. Um, for security, which is sad because that used to be like where all the towny people would go, was further down. Because when the media trucks pull out, then you can kind of move in. Right. Um, so it's, yeah, and then you could like get high fives from all the runners and stuff. The kids used to enjoy that. So, disappointed that we can't do that anymore. But yeah. understand the reason why. Got it. Thanks, Ben. So the overall budget increase is? The overall budget increase. Let's turn to page one of this document and talk about that. If that's the best place to look at that. So I like the other sources and uses presentation. That we have in the appropriations report. And I would hang my hat on. This right here. Page eight. Um, You know, we present it in so many places in so many ways. And then it's printing over. I guess the reason I'm asking is um, I think the number that the overall budget increases, the operating budget seemed to be higher than that amount, both the school as well as um, you know, some of the public safety. So I'm just wondering how we got to a lower amount. Is it in the operating budget or is it in other parts of the budget? Sure, so the, the total expenditure increase is 7.66%. Okay. Uh, in terms of the tax impact, because there's some offsets there with other, other receipts, ambulance receipts, um, funds from the Library Foundation for help for, to assist with debt service. Um, but in terms of the overall increase in terms of tax levy, it's 5.42%, um, with 2.93 from new growth and 2.5 from the existing tax base. I guess if you if you look at either the net sources or the net uses on the sheet, it goes from 74.96 million to 80.70 million, and that would be the dollar change. Which page are you on? I'm sorry. I'm trying to, for, for a high level question, I'm trying to stick to page one of the document okay. that Ben's trying to send. Yeah. It, it's been sent. I, yeah, you no, I have it. I have it. Okay. So that's where you can track both the sources and uses which are in balance, right? So they, they're going up, the uses are going up from 74.96 to 80.70 or 71. Do the cherry sheet um, offsets 
reflect the governor's budget or the house's budget? Uh, the governor's budget. Um, the budget that was released um, by the House Ways and Means about a thirty-four thousand dollar difference. Um, an increase. An increase, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. So, so should we be considering that? I know that's not final, and I don't know what the Senate's going to do. Um, it's still not final, and it's not that much of an increase. If we chased the whole appropriations process, it would be, I think, kind of problematic. Okay. So if it was a million dollar increase that was being proposed, or mm -hmm. uh, but, 34, but, it, but it seems yeah. like it, it's a it's a change in an estimate that we know is going to change again. Uh, so we have not updated the whole package with that. Okay. So this potentially is showing less revenue than we may be getting because so we basically have to take our best guess just because yeah. we don't get the budget till it's not finalized until july yes yeah, so there's so you have the house budget the senate budget the vetoes from the governor and then it goes back right back and right. forth and they, they whatever they can override and, right. and then there's the bigger guess on local receipts you know on what that number will come in at so so the the estimate on the state aid kind of pales compared to the estimate of local receipts. Dave, what's the other, is there another big item that's variable on the front end, on the revenue side? Yeah, so, so I believe that everyone should remember that um, these are all estimates, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. So I can, any, any and most of the revenues that we were projecting here are estimates based upon, you know, our best guess in trying to maintain a, a reasonableness, you know, and being fair and, and equitable and mm -hmm. presenting the right information. Um, I believe even as we got closer last year to town meeting, a lot of these items changed at the last, within the last week. Yeah. So that there were, you know, some things that the, depending on tax impact, you know, if that if it's material, we could try to apply it right. up until up right up until if it's not, we could let it flow flow to free cash. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and try to put some of that money aside. You know, and, and likewise, there are estimates built into the expense side too, like snow and ice things yeah. that we don't know what they'll be. So, so there there are a lot of estimates in the whole uh, balance. Tim, it sounds like it explains itself, but could you give me an explanation of um, what the free cash, uh, capital, and other uh, is identifying? So you're, you're looking at page one of this document? I am. And you're in the box that's highlighted? I am in the box that's highlighted. And you're it's, uh, asking about the... $1.995 million. Got it. And then the 234 in operating free cash and then the capital free cash. Yep. I'm assuming operating free cash is free cash from the operating budget last year that didn't get spent. No. No? no? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll take a shot. Yeah, yeah. Dave has explained this to me once, so rather than having me explain what I think he told me, I'll ask him to explain the break. <coughs> so um, the two... Uh, starting from the top down, the 234,800 is the um, wait, wait, soon, thanks. We we uh, are funding something through free cash. This year's free cash that's in the operating budget. Um, so that's why that one's in its own category. So rather than it being a capital capital. Um, per se, it's a, it's a part of the operating budget. Um, it's a big expense, but we were able to clear some room. The one nine nine five. So before you move on, I'm sorry. So when you say this year for fiscal year 2020, that's what we're going to be spending towards the operating budget. That's correct. From free cash. Right. Okay. For Thank stormwater. You. For stormwater management. And okay. can you tell us? Can you tell us why we're doing it that way when we have unused levy capacity? Um, we do not have unused levy. We do not have unused levy capacity. We have a top line that was set by the board of selectmen in this budget meets the top line set by the board of selectmen. What was the top line set? It was to have a two and a half percent impact tax impact on the existing tax base net of new growth. Yeah, that was an amended amended message, right? Because the original yes, message was three percent. Uh, two point nine two. 
And then there was direction, which is uh, uh, within the purview of the board to adjust as the process went on, and we have done so. I think that, um, did that uh, answer your line question? No, we're, we're, we're spending for the operating budget from free cash in this particular line, the 230 some odd thousand. Which means in this line, year. but is it a recurring or non-recurring item? So um, storm water. So it, it is a recurring item. So so that item ends up being, and I know that this is pennies on on the eighty million dollar budget or whatever, but um, that ends up being part of the base next year for the levy increase or the levy limit calculation, correct? It's but good. this year it's coming out of operating budget. Next year, it, it assumably wouldn't be. So we we will have free cash next year, and I would not uh, I would not advocate for continuing to fund the same operating expense out of free cash every year. Right. Okay. So and again, again, although you said this is a small amount, if we're trying to keep the tax levy down, but we don't have anything finalized, um, I feel like we're just playing a game here. You know, it's why not just put it into the budget? Because we always seem to come. You know, we say that this is a budget and this is what we're anticipating the tax levy to be, but then it always seems to come down lately lower because the receipts come in greater than we thought, or we get more state aid. Um, and so I feel sometimes that we're not paying, you know, we're not, the expenses are lower when we're forcing them to be lower when in fact the tax rate is gonna meet the, the message from the Board of Selectmen. So the budgeting is conservative. Mm -hmm. So you, t that, and that means estimating low on revenue and estimating high on expenses so that you don't run afoul of, uh, you don't run into a real problem where you have to lay people off or you have to interrupt projects and incur all kinds of start and stop costs. And uh, if we probably would not have free cash at the end of every year if we budgeted tightly on revenue and we budgeted tightly on expenses. Right. So instead we budget conservatively and I think that's why we have the free cash. Some of it is that- Isn't technically free cash taxing people more than we need to because we don't spend everything that we, all of the tax revenue we've brought in? And again, this isn't, I mean, I, this is a discussion we should be having with the Board of Selectmen. I'm yeah. sorry to be, you know. But it all evens out over time because then if you have free cash, it's what we don't, it's if we're reckless with the free cash year over year and I'm, Assuming that we're not, we are kind of whatever we, mm -hmm. the items that we spend it on, we usually pretty much need. Yeah. So it does allow us a cushion that if we don't have the free cash for whatever happens, the lo local receipts don't come in as expected or, or the governor's budget's not as high, that the next year we don't have to be, we, have, we can cut down on, we can skip a year on some of the, the capital items that we need mm -hmm. or, or push it off to another well, year. And that's typically what we do. We have that, we have better control. Although I do agree, I'm, this is like the first year I've seen that we're actually using free cash for operating right, expenses yeah. that are recurring expenses. And that is not something we want to do. No, I, I agree. And I think, I, I personally think that this year that, uh, and I, I, speaking out of turn without having them here to, to give their say, but um, it seems like the number two and a half percent is taking on this life of its own right now and being able to say, you know, we're not going to go above 2.5% when the operating budget is increasing more than 2.5% uh, in a way that affects the taxpayers. It's just we're kind of, we're doing a little bit of a shell game yeah. here. Um, you know, I, there's, there's part of me that totally agrees with you when I see year after year we have, you know, a couple million dollars, a million and a half to two million dollars in free cash um, that's coming from the prior year's budget. I think to myself, all right, we collected money from the taxpayers that we didn't need. Right. Is that appropriate? But I also have been on the Board of Selectmen with a lot of people who said, you know, let's run this like a business. You know, we got to run this like a business. There's no business out there that cuts it so close that there's no wiggle room in the budget whatsoever. And, um, and so I think that when we start looking at percentages 
and I look at the $2 million as a percentage of an $80 million budget, you know, that's about 2.5%. Um, there are probably very few big companies out there, uh, public companies, that are going to cut things within 2.5% and not have any way out from that point on. You know, especially when you're talking about it, you know, I mean, I'm looking through a budget here, and maybe, maybe it's put into a different bucket, but this year I'm looking at uh, zero dollars allocated for employee training. Um, you know, and I think that... So that there, there is... Um, personal, sir. It, it falls on the HR budget. Okay, so that's, that's that's that was one of my questions in the report. I'm like, right. how can we do this? Right. <laughs> you know? That that's a relief. But uh, you know, I know that in the past, you know, in speaking with Mr. Kamalo about you know how much he spends on training, he's always looking for you know extremely efficient ways to budget training for employees for you know whether it's Microsoft Microsoft skills or you know something else. So um, the the two million dollars doesn't bother me um, that much uh, but I guess this this um, incredibly strict adherence to uh, this two and a half percent number this year it seems it seems um, uncharacteristic from prior years um, and we seem to be jumping through hoops that we wouldn't normally jump through to in my opinion unless I heard some other explanation of what's happening it's it's a relatively artificial number when it's presented to the to the town meeting members and the taxpayers. And the question I guess is it sustainable? Are we just sort of by eating into this free cash, are we just kicking a can down the road and setting us up for a problem? So so that's kind of the the yeah. thing about free cash, uh, to just in defense of the concept and you've all kind of raised this issue is uh, it's true that we are taxing and taking and took that money and then it shows up again at, as free cash when something doesn't get done or money doesn't get spent because jobs, typically because jobs are vacant for part of the year. And, you know, personnel budget, which is 70% of our budget, doesn't get expended and then uh, that, that feeds into the free cash or projects don't get executed or purchases don't get made or Ben finds efficiencies in making a, a buy. So the good thing is then that money doesn't just get spent as it would in the federal government. And I'll tell you straight up, that's what would happen. There is no free cash in the federal government. It gets spent and it stay and it comes back and then it goes back to the town meeting to be appropriated again. So it's true that the town is holding that money that a, a tighter budget wouldn't hold, uh, but it's not being spent and it's, it's being used again. And, you know, you could do an exercise and lower the level in that lake and there would be a little one-time pause where people would feel a little one-time, uh, a little one-time benefit, which I think would be about, I want to say 20, 20 cents for the average taxpayer. I think, you know, it's a penny for every $40,000 on the average house. To, if we drew that down, and then we wouldn't have that free cash, we'd be operating in a much tighter, uh, much tighter environment. So, I think there's some merit to the way the system works. And if we had five million in free cash on the space of budget, that would really kind of beg some question. But it seems like uh, the money is not being squandered, and it's not going astray. It just keeps cycling at that consistent level through the system. So. It's like someone driving around with a tank full of gas and another person drives around with a quarter of a tank of gas all the time. Every time they're out, they fill up to a quarter of a tank. Well, we're, we were fill up to a little more of our gas tank for driving around. I guess that would be the, the metaphor. You can stop that practice and you're only saving that one piece of a tank full one time and then you're driving around with an empty tank when the hurricane comes. So. So the bottom line is those two free cash numbers in that section are both basically how free cash is being allocated this year for spending. It's not. Um, um, right. Um, so we have 3.2 million in free cash. Mm -hmm. We're going to be using 2.23 uh, million um, in the proposed FY20 budget. The other portion, uh, the remainder of that is being is targeted for FY19 um, snow and ice deficit, mm -hmm. and we at the prior town meeting, at the special town meeting, we allocated two projects 
capital projects. I can't remember for the amount. Uh, <clears throat> so if I could refer you to page three of the um, the document that Tim. Uh, that, that's an outline of, of the expenditures of free cash. Page which? Page three. 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 Okay. Uh, about 100,000 for prior year bills, 57,000 for the fire communication system, and 140,000 for the Lake Maspinock Dam gate. That's so okay. to sort of build on what Tim said, um, so right now we're we're covering a lot of deficits for the current year, where we're doing a number of capital projects. Um, so if we were to tighten up on the revenues, our estimates to lower the, you know, impact, we still would have to address these capital assets as part of the, the ongoing budget process. So it would still impact the people, it just would be uh, six months later than we normally are doing. So taking advantage of the free cash by the, the surplus free cash. Mm -hmm. So snow and ice this year was what around 1.1 million or so altogether. So, what did we have? 350, 350 last year. We're, we're still waiting for a number on that. Um, they haven't got all their bills in yet. So is 742 an estimate, or 742 is the bills we have so far? 742 is an estimate as of this point. Oh, didn't seem like that bad a winter, yeah. did it? <laughs> Sorry? Didn't seem like that bad a winter. The end, the 16 inches we got in March. <laughs> so it's, uh, again, it's not necessarily just um, the, the rain and snow, it's also ice. Mm -hmm. So they have to go out and see and do things like that. So, so back we, we, we never even got any snow, but there was a nice buildup. Back up on page one in that same section. Um, what's the other bucket that's $1.1 million? So that's, um, we have um, resources. So um, the ambulance uh, has its own uh, receipts reserve that they take in from there. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a $525,000 um, influx from that receipts reserve into the general fund to cover the ambulance budget that's in the you know, bus budget. Um, we also do the Title V loan. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that service that gets transferred to the general fund. Uh, those are the other two. Uh, so <clears throat> oh, yeah, premium on bonds, the uh, library foundation um, to assist with the debt service, um, about approximately 400000 and then a higher estimate for the, the resale of surplus property. Uh, rather than a trade-in, we'll be putting things out about the auction or bid. So it's other outside sources that we have on hand. And why is stabilization at zero in that same? So we're not taking any out. Oh, well, that's a good thing. Yeah, that is a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's how we put more in. Right. Yeah. Okay. What is the uh, current level? Uh, so 208,000 is what we'll be putting in um, this year. Right. And what what is in the fund right now? Yeah, I have a. I think it's actually in the appropriate uh, report. The balance in there or is just. Sorry, I didn't read it for so that much detail. <laughs> yes. Uh, we have a little section there about our investments, and that's one of our investments. Well, it would be 4000 I mean, $4 million. Uh, yeah. OPEB. Okay, other trust funds. So I can pull that up while we're talking. The report, oh, 4.1. Let's see. So I don't know who just wrote those in. Is that a comment you put in? Would be about 4.1. But I actually have stabilization trust fund has a balance of 3.43 million, with an additional proposed to be added. So that was the number out of the investment account on March 31st. 3.43 million in the stabilization fund. And, and I think the 4.1 number you're referencing there, Tim, is that would be if it was 5%, which is the recommended um, level by the DOR. Right. We also have a capital stabilization fund that's at 321000 The capital stabilization fund was at 216 and you're saying it should be at 321 mm. Okay. I'll have to, I'll have to uh, unless the funds are split into several accounts. 
but that's what the our brokerage account is showing. So we're slightly under if we were at 5% with that um, contribution for stabilization. We're still slightly under 5%, correct? Affirmative, yes. Right. And the only reason I raise that is we're having good times now. Those aren't, these aren't going to last forever, and that's when we have to dip into the stabilization fund. So again, just like these, this is my mantra. Right, no, <laughs> it's... We'll tag in with the stabilization, I feel like, rather than trying to target it. 2.5% because that's just a number we should be considering trying to save some money now as well um, while we do have the increased you know receipts and, and new growth so one of the things that we put in the uh, appropriations committee report is that the stabilization fund is invested in a mix of investments with a 30% common stock allocation which is riskier than we have our normal daily weekly receipts and disbursements and which we have in like money market demand accounts so uh, if you, if we think times are going to be good it's very prudent to have some money in stocks so that we get a better return uh, the, the trick with stabilization funds is they're supposed to be there when things are bad so if you have a bad turn in the economy and you have your stabilization funds in stock uh, that can backfire on you mm -hmm. but we've made some good returns lately on that stabilization fund so one of the things we should be thinking about in the long run is what's our risk profile for that fund yep. and if it's uh, we need that money to be available in the worst of years uh, maybe when we hit the target point we should think about the asset allocation in that account who decides the investment strategy for that Excuse me? Who decides on the strategy? So the treasurer is charged with that duty, has a statutory charge for doing that. And as my employee, I supervise that, and Norman does too, and we are beginning quarterly reporting up through the Board of Selectmen. So the treasurer will be making a report to the Board of Selectmen next Tuesday. To report and recommendations? Like, would he, or would they say? So we will listen. We will listen. We listen to what the Appropriations Committee has to say. We'll listen to what the selectmen have to say. Uh, so we have our current funds in the safest investments that are yielding us about 2.3% now, 2.4%. We have the stabilization fund in a mix with 30% equities that's yielding us quite good returns over the last few months. And we have the OPEB uh, up to... 55% equities, and that's been yielding us very good returns over the last few months. Uh, so are you talking we've only changed this over the last few months? Or we haven't changed it. This is what they've been. But it, we had a bad, there, you remember there was a little cliff mm -hmm. in the fall and stocks went down, and now they've recovered and they're bouncing back up. So we had a reporting period where our, our asset allocation uh, didn't, uh, produce good results over a one period and we have recovered from that and so uh, having watched that little blip we're, we're talking about what our risk profile should be in these three different categories so our operating funds are in the most conservative possible place our OPEB is weighted 55 percent with stocks and we don't expect to use that money in the next 10 years uh, so the big question is, is the stabilization right about halfway between right. those two? Or should we take a different risk perspective and uh, cut back on the equity exposure in that portfolio, giving up those gains? So we have an investment advisor, but the investment advisor can really only tell you what's a good portfolio for your risk profile and your risk appetite. It's really up to us to decide what our risk appetite is for, for uh, uh, pursuing gains on those funds. I can uh, give okay. you the updated balances if you Sure. So um, in the general stabilization, it's 
3.433 millimeters. <coughs> Capital stabilization is 320-300. And OPEB is 2.45 million. So capital is 320,000 or? 320,000. Okay. 300. Yeah. So I know that um, part of the AC review is to make recommendations. What if we went back to the Board of Selectmen and said we wanted to see some of these funds in funded more this year? I'm rocking the boat a little bit here, but we tried to get that message across last year and it wasn't heard. Are we talking OPEG? OPEG and the stabilization as well. Just putting that out there for us to think about. So what would be the recommended, um, based on our operational budget, what should our stabilization fund be at? Five million, right? Four point four point one million. I'm sorry. Four point one. And before our contribution, it's at 3.4. And we have a planned $200,000 contribution, which brings us to 3.6, and we could have some gains. I mean, it's not a, uh, that, that is not a, we're not terribly far behind there. But again, we're having good times right now. Exactly. I, I, so I we're like a half a million off. <clears throat> I mean, that's probably too much to ask, but. I'm personally less concerned with the stabilization fund because that's a nice to have cushion. Um, but OPEB is an obligation. It's essentially, that's an obligation based on services we are getting today that we should be contributing today that we're I used to use the term, we're just kicking that one, kicking the can down the road. Mm -hmm. It's going to, so we're asking future generations to pay a cost for services that we're benefiting from today. And so they, they recommended it was 800000 and we're yeah. putting in 400000 Yeah. So, so the actuary yeah. recommended. Like 625 from the actuary. Yeah, there was, there was two glide paths the actuary had. One was 625 escalated 3% a year. And one, the other one was about 800000 And then you wouldn't have to escalate it. But you would just pay that until it was caught up. At the same time, I, I think in our report there was a comment that uh, the recommendation, if you're, if we're, if we're doing the pay as you go as we are now, um, the recommendation is trying to maintain at least a level of 66% funded, which is where we are. 66% funded for what? For, for our obligations. For the retirement and not the OPEB. Yeah, the, the OPEB oh, is, is, the, is the health care benefit. Mm -hmm. Right. No, I, I thought I was reading about the OPEB. The retirement is funded at 67%. Okay. The OPEB is funded at a much lower rate. All right. Uh, it's funded at... Uh, Page 23 is the... 3.26% of the liability. Oh. A little different. Yeah. You know, if you go through the history of OPEB, you know, we've only been starting to contribute to it since, I don't know, 2011 or 2012. But at the time when we had the actu actuarial numbers, by contributing 344 to 400, that was actually going to get us on our way. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but what happened is, I think because of low interest rates, you know, a lot of it, it's, depending how it was invested, we weren't getting the, the return, so now that's why now our contributions have to be higher because we're not, I think they're saying we can get 8 to 10% return every year on OPEB. That was uh, when we had the initial presentation. And I don't think we get 8 to 10% on a conservative. On a conservative portfolio, it's your, you'd be very challenged to do that. <clears throat> so we're, if we're using the actuarial $225,000 short, of what we should be funding it. 225 below what the actuary recommended as the ideal funding path. And again, this is not a requirement yet, so that we're doing anything is a good thing. And uh, so, so unlike the pension part, which we're required to be on a catch-up path 
by 2036. Uh, there is no requirement yet to fund the OPEB, just a requirement to report it, and there's encouragement to fund it. Mm -hmm. there, there potential, potentially, will be, um, because of GASP 74 and 75, will be an issue with the exposure on the outside for our AAA rating if we if we are not actively doing something with both of them. And I, I think it's, it's probably reasonable that at some point there will be a requirement to get to a funding level on a glide path, and the people who are already halfway there are going to have a much easier time when that happens. Mm -hmm. I would like to see us fund funded at the uh, six twenty five amount that's recommended. Okay, I don't I don't disagree and, <laughs> and I can definitely go to the board of selectmen yeah. and make that recommendation. Is this the year though? Given the guidance from the selectmen, given what we hear about tax, the burden, I just wonder. Well, we can say happens. our recommendation, whether they take it or not. Yeah. You know, they're. I think you're correct. They're, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They'll nod their head and not make, not recommend any changes. Do we want to vote on the recommendation, or I don't, you know. Well, we can do that when, if we're done. Okay. I mean, we're done yeah. deliberating at the end. Yeah. Bas basically, vote on what we want to recommend to the board of okay. selectmen. Okay. In terms of operational budget. And I, I believe in the report, there is at least going from the prior year reports. There's a either an endorse. There's an endorsement, or I guess the alternative of not endorsing the budget. That's the, I mean, the report is a report. Right. I just, again, I'm feeling like we're not actually having input into the budget, and so I think if we can at least recommend something mm -hmm. back to the Board of Selectmen, I'd, I'd like to do that. Yep. Any other comments on page one? <laughs> We're trying to get to page five. question about the MSBA reimbursements projected for 2021. What project is that related to? The Marathon School. Uh, no. Is it, oh, that's the high school. That's the uh, high, high, high school. Yeah, the yeah. 1.4 that's called out. Okay. Change in the reimbursement methodology. Right. The time. I was going to say, I think the MSBA still owes maybe 4% of Marathon, but yeah. and they're waiting for the final closeout. Or, they're waiting right. for the final closeout. Yeah, yeah. So, so I've been following. We've been following this for several years, and actually, we made a note of it in last year's budget report. That when you look at the debt, we, we we made a special chart that shows when you look at the debt that comes off, it's pretty much the uh, the high school. Mm -hmm. So that comes off at the end of 2021 into the 22 budget. So if you look at the debt, you notice the debt goes down two million dollars a year. The debt service, but you notice. And I think 1.6 million of that is our payment, is debt service for the high school out of that 2 million. But you have to keep in mind that 1.487 is actually the reimbursement that we get. So when the, because everyone's saying, oh, the high school's coming off. It's so the really reimbursement going to save us 200,000 a year because of the MSB, MSB mm -hmm. reimbursement. We should probably figure out a way to represent that in the graph. What what of our debt is covered through external sources? That's an interesting point. So the, it's also the library, the million dollar from the library trust. Right. They've had it for the 
if they've had it, they'll, they'll have another substantial amount for 2020, and then it'll go, <coughs> there'll be like 100,000 left for 21, and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. So it's been over $400,000 uh, for the last two years, uh, 19 and 20. And so there'll be, like I said, there'll be like about 107,000 uh, left right now. So we're going to be adding on another 300,000 because mm -hmm. that money's not going to be there at the offset. So. You know, and that, that was my initial concern that they're doing a, an underwrite, the operational budget. And, you know, to keep it at 2.5%, I guess that'll be possible, but the library was a debt exclusion, so the debt is part of a debt exclusion for the library, so that'll show our, that'll show our tax impact, but it will not be part of the 2.5%, uh, the, the Prop 2.5% levy. Mm -hmm. Okay, moved off of page one. <laughs> yeah, I know they have the expenditures by category. That's interesting, but I think this, there's more details in the following pages. So Starting on page five, you get the get more information yeah. on that. So on page five, remind me again why the town manager's budget is up 33 percent. Because the assistant town manager was formerly carried as the land use director in the land use budget. And so that was a change in the way that is that position is being funded. So formerly it was the department head for the land use, and right. now it's assistant town manager. That accounts for about half of that number, right? Is it the 49,000 that's coming from land use up into the town manager's budget? About 108, yeah. <clears throat> so it's a, bit. It's, it's a little bit less than that. Land use planning and permitting. So they're adding other yeah. stuff in. So I see their, I just see their budgets coming down by 49,000 so, so personal services. Yeah, other things happened as well. Okay. So uh, that added into theirs. They've had some, they've had some turnover. They, they had to hire at a higher rate than they, than they previously had to. And I believe they went from part time to full time. Seeing a shift in assessors between appraisal and personal, is that? So the assessors, it's not, uh, that shift. There's no net, that, it's just between the. That little shift was about the sharing of a, there's a shared positions between the assessor and the treasurer and the payroll. And uh, there was a reshuffling of that position this year. Like so the assessors or? have the uh, more clerical. So, so the assessors have a stable workforce. Uh, what they need is more appraisal support for specialized uh, appeal work, like, let's say, a large liquid natural gas facility or uh, a, bit, a large industrial facility that's outside their skill set to develop an appraisal for, that you have to find very specialized people to do the, that kind of work. So we're seeing uh, we have a program of doing that on a rolling basis. I think next year we're going to look at cell towers to see if we're appraising cell towers correctly. So and are we using outside service? I know we did for the gas, um, yes. the gas facility. We use an outside service. Yes and yes. And we're also using it for a couple of potential uh, acquisitions, some land acquisitions okay. uh, that we're using appraisal services for. So if there's, this is a little off topic, but if there's, if we score a windfall, I guess, for lack of a better word, because of this appraisal, how are they paid? 
the appraisal services in a case like where we're revaluing the liquid natural gas facility or we would be going after the cell towers? Is it a flat fee or is it? We, we, pay, we pay for the service and it's not a contingency. Okay. They're not, they're, they're, they get paid for their service. And if we prevail, we'll, we'll be much better off. And if we don't prevail, we'll, we'll have spent that money and have found out what the real value is. So. Okay, thanks. Tim, do you know what the headcount change, the planned headcount change is in this budget? I think I can probably give you the ads except for the school, and I have those on a separate page somewhere. We're looking at a new police sergeant, three new firefighters, and one of your notes today was about why the compensation contingency went up. We had put three new firefighters in the fire department, but there's a grant opportunity that if we hire three, we can get a fourth funded. Mm -hmm. And so, but if we've already hired the three, we can't get the grant. So we're going to hold the, those three in the compensation contingency until we find out about the grant and, and uh, make a move at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have a public health nurse. Uh, I mentioned the police sergeant, the three firefighters. Uh, Half a position in the HR. Half a benefits, a benefits manager to handle the the hundreds of retirees who come into HR to get service on their retiree benefits, uh, and then a number of positions in the schools. And I think you saw in the schools spreadsheet the, the net changes they had. They did a lot of shuffling, and I want to say there was five or eight new positions in the schools. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing that as growth. Those are the position, that's the position accretion that I'm seeing. Can you tell us off the top of your head which departments have staff increases? Yes, police for one, fire for three, uh, schools, uh, health, and the half a position you just say HR, HR. And I think that's, yeah, I wouldn't, I'm not, that's not a sworn statement, but I think that's all the added positions. What is, what is I'm sorry, you human said, resources, sorry, HR. Um, one? Half. Half, yeah. And Board of Health? One for a public health nurse. A one police sergeant. Three firefighters. Okay. And then the schools. And I have the package on my desk. I was just looking at it. But they had a complex presentation about $400,000 in reduction positions, and there were fractional positions, and then $817,000 in added positions. So they have a large growth number. Most of it's going to salary increases. So I think they got rid of, they changed from paraprofessionals to full-time aides, or? Trying to, yeah, I think they're trying to support this year with paraprofessionals, but no new growth, and then they're converting okay. those. Right, so <clears throat> five uh, special education paraprofessionals, and there's some offsets. Um, uh, personnel decreases, uh, one literary coach, uh, half a principal, um, three-tenths of a librarian, uh, the guidance secretary from 12 months to 10 months, um, one ELD teacher, one learning specialist, and one special education coach. Um, <clears throat> and there's some additional increases on the, on the other side, the largest in addition to the special education paraprofessionals is three elementary paraprofessionals. And that's outlined on page 16 of the PowerPoint presentation. So back on the, um, the town, and this might have been prior year, but the move of the um, land use person into the town manager office, was that ever backfilled? No, she supervises the land use department okay so she's she's a also a department head and the assistant town manager that's my my understanding she and she's I don't know if she physically moved I wasn't here but I 
my sense is she physically moved down to the space. The three of us were, were uh, came after that happened. Yeah, I thought so. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. everything was in disarray, and they moved over to South Street for a year right, and a half, and then right. when they came back here, she was just down in the space. And I, I don't know, did the town manager have a half-time position before that, and he, they, they gapped that and then went full-time? It's really it's not uh, something that you want to talk about. Okay, about all right. Um, I have a question on a small line item, but um, I thought that in the uh, draft of the appropriations uh, report, there's a conflicting number with what's here on page 11 um, for the townwide celebration, Hopkinton Day. Was that money removed in the latest version? It was. There is a plan to fund it through other means. Uh -huh. um, and it, at the moment, um, we're still, um, uh, again, as we spoke earlier about the revenue being estimates and things haven't finalized. Um, we currently believe that there may be some room that gets freed up from the free time, sorry, from the uh, snow and ice. Mm -hmm. That um, if that happens, we'd like to be able to add it back in, but it has to go back through the approval process. Mm -hmm. If we do that, so there would be a fifty-eight thousand dollar gain back from Snow Nights, and we're hoping to fund that, that put that back into the operating budget. What was that line item? Thirty thousand before. Thirty thousand, correct. So. I hate to pick it, it such a small line, line item, but it seems like that's a number that, um, symbolically, you know, I mean, it uh, it shows support for the town and, you know, celebrating the town itself. I know that when we had the 300-year celebration, um, that was the most unifying event that the town has had in quite a while. I mean, yeah, yesterday is a huge event, obviously, every, every year in town. But it's not something that's just for the people of Hopkinton. And um, to me, I think that the intent of still funding this somehow is a great intent. Mm -hmm. But I think the symbolism of having the number in the budget saying, yes, we are, we are funding this. And if the number has to come out of, you know, uh, snow and ice or wherever else, then, you know, we should be taking it out of that. But... Um, I mean, I would recommend through you, town manager, board of selectmen, or whomever, that uh, that, that number be replaced. And I actually disagree. I think that $30,000 is half of a FTE. That's what basically is going up in smoke in one night. Um, in other areas of the country, people, businesses contribute to that. They sponsor these kind of events um, and that we're using town money, something I've never agreed with. So. Um, we're just on the other side of the, the spectrum here. I think other money can be not from town money, but from finding a sponsor. That's why you sit down the other That's end of the table, the huh? <laughs> 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 but I, also, I also think we did something similarly for the 300th celebration that we couldn't find it immediately in the budget, and we found a way at, at the end. I don't know, I can't remember how that was done, but you know, even at, after we go through town meeting, if there are some accounts that still have we do account transfers, you know, for small amounts at, after, you know, in June. In June, so that could be a way it's, it's funded, too. Right. Right. That was the plan. That was the original plan, since they had us pull it out. But. So end of year balances, so to speak? So end of year residual balances? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. haven't been used. Mm -hmm. I guess for me, I look at it as, um, you know, how the, the optics of it and the message that those optics uh, send. And um, when, it's, when it's, you know, sweeping together the scraps off the table to put into a bucket and say, look at that, see, we can still do it this year. That's different from saying, yes, we're going to fund this. And, um, you know, yeah, we had to take from this, this, and that you know, to fund it, um, and oh, okay, now we have this other money left over, now we can replenish those. Who puts it as a, so, as a so priority? Just curious, how much is left in the Appropriation Committee Reserve Fund? 
think all of it. Have you spent any of the 125,000? Not for this year, right? <laughs> there's, a, there's one or two minuscule ones. Do, do I hear a motion coming to the floor? <laughs> <laughs> <to the laughs> I'm just saying we do account transfers. That that's usually one of them because mm -hmm. you know I don't. We haven't had any requests to dip into our reserve this year. Yeah. They yeah. usually come at the end of the year, but yeah. Right. But yeah, <clears throat> I know what you're saying. So well, I'll communicate that to the town manager, that your view, and I'm going to communicate your view unless the group wants to take a vote or take a position on that issue. Does anyone have then we'll communicate thoughts that. on an amount? I mean, if I'm looking 30,000. 30? Is, is the amount we had in there. Is that, that's correct, right? 30,000? 30,000. I mean, if you want to discuss it, it's the same thing. We have account transfers, so you can either say we'll put it in here and then we'll raise the levy on, on folks above, won't be a lot, above 2.5%, but then and then the, the, the account transfer would either not happen and it would go into the general fund or, or we'll spend it on something else. So, I mean, and if, you, if you think about the way this, the ball bounces through the maze, if you don't spend any of your reserve, that will go into the free cash that will be certified for the 2021 budget. Right. So that's, we're back to this free cash discussion and how that works. So. Well, I would say if we're going to take a vote on this, and we also take a vote on the OPEB and the other things, um, which I just feel are more important, quite honestly. So. Yeah, and my my personal my personal I guess stand on this is that I'm not going to I'm not going to vote in favor of anything that increases the bottom line right now. Um, if if people have suggestions of where we could move money from one spot to another uh, and maintain either the same bottom line or lower it and offer that to the Board of Selectmen. That's something I would consider. Um, but I'm not going to vote in favor of increasing the bottom line by 30,000 or 225,000 or, you know, or 255,000 to get them both, so. And I probably would, so. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that uh, actually the end of the night, I think, huh? Okay. For uh, account 542, Youth and Family Services, the expenses are up 31%. What page are you on? 10. Okay. I know there was a change. Yeah, Ben, do you have the detail sheet on 542, the expenses? You bear with me. I'll pull it up in just one moment. I don't know that's off my head. I heard the 542 and I was looking for a dollar amount. I'm like, oh, wait, you're talking about, I don't know. I, I know we, I'm in a room full of tech savvy people, but I miss actual budget books where every <coughs> number has seven pages behind it <laughs> and you have a lieutenant who carries the book. <laughs> okay. I'm glad we're not there. <laughs> well, the next one is going to be Veteran Services 543. That, that's up 44%. Yeah, so that's a that's a cost share arrangement uh, with a couple jurisdictions, and it was a recruitment and service level change to try to expand the services. Uh, Doesn't that also depend on the number of people actually being served? The there are cash. So yeah. there's seven people currently payments, but it's not. Yeah. Most of it is this is the, the operation of the support, the advice that the agent provides, which can relate to everything from social security to health care to to uh, education benefits and everything else. If 
like we made a transfer into this account sometime this past year. Was, couple, was it? I remember one like two years ago we had. Well, every time we're servicing another per veteran, yeah. it yeah. goes up. And that's why I was kind of asking the question: yeah. Is it for there all be, these? There will be a um, either reserve fund transfer or a line item transfer at the end of the year. They've already overspent. There are there are a lot of budget. Um, okay. I believe I believe it's somewhere between um, eight and ten thousand, but don't quote me on that's a rough figure. So isn't that also a largely reimbursable expense? So seventy five percent. Seventy five percent. So so the numbers look more impactful when you look at the expenditure than they are because the state is a cost share partner. Uh, but usually the money doesn't show up till the next year. Right. So it's sort of a revolving kind of thing. You pay out and then you get the money back as bus. So why isn't it a revolving account? Say it again. Is it possible to set up a revolving account for this? I, like the school has tons of them. That's so <laughs> well, so we, we have a sh an expense share. We, we have an expense share too. So mm -hmm. we would have to make contributions to the revolving fund and then get the state share. And I don't know. We only, we only receive 75% back. So. I, we're not covering our costs, right? No. Say. So I don't under that it's not. We'd have not to manage a, that they're pulling in a fee. Yeah, we'd have to manage and fund the contribution fee. every year, and I don't think we'd be a dollar ahead. So you might get a little more. But I think we have the opportunity to have that level of clarity without going through the exercise mm -hmm. of the revolving fund. Okay. Yeah, we don't want more revolving funds kind of want to get rid of them when we don't need them. And yeah. this, this is a pretty small overall expense. And to circle back on the youth and family services, uh, so substantially all that increase is uh, contracted services for pet therapy. Um, and that's providing weekly pet services to town apartments, the library, schools, and senior center, and uh, individual families on an ad-needed basis. So we increased the budget last year for pet therapy. They're increasing it further? Just curious, how much of that fifty-five thousand is for pet therapy, therapy dogs? I guess thirteen thousand. Yeah, thirteen to eighty. Thirteen thousand increase or thirteen thousand total? Again, I thought we funded this last year. Well. Excuse me. Thank you. So it's Sorry. funny the things that you said. You know, you talk about fireworks and uh, therapy dogs. <laughs> Something's not adding up here. Sorry. Excuse me. If you just. Sorry. Uh, it's okay. I, the 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 narrative is out of order, so I, I may have misspoke. Okay, so I misspoke. Yeah, it, it appears that last year it was classified under personnel services at 13,000. So there's a decrease in personnel services for youth and family services for 20, and it's reclassified to um, uh, contract services. Okay, for so there's an increase, so, and it's just getting reclassified. Co correct. Yep. Yeah. Okay, that explains it. Somebody remind me what the tree warden increase was. I know it was discussed at one of the meetings. Uh, so that, that's a, an increase to, to um, mitigate eight to ten additional trees. Um, that's one of the current budget, about $25,000. So they've had a disease to great uh, so have mitigate so, trees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they've had that's some great so luck. Uh, uh, yeah, take down, you know, okay. fell uh, or uh, it, you know, trim uh, because Eversource will only do certain pieces of, of the town so that there may be dead or dying trees that are on other pieces of the road that, that Eversource won't won't assist with or if they're not near wires uh, but are still a danger to, to public health okay that's it so we considered stringing wires near all the dead trees but <laughs> it was easier to just 
on the tree. <laughs> <word. laughs> In the hope that Eversource would then trim the tree for us, but it, it was not the official Eight for effort. <laughs> but if a tree comes down is that and blocks a road, is that the tree warden or is that DPW? D DPW if it comes down. Right. Okay. Right. Tree warden keeps them from coming down. Or, or it takes them down. down. Yeah. It takes them down. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Manage to take down. And I, as a new resident, I'm still waiting for my trash bill to come. <laughs> it's the only place I've ever lived where I didn't get billed for trash pickup. So. Don't put in more than one container, or you will. Every, pay. every time you pay your tax bill, you pay your I'm trash bill. I'm paying every time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Don't give any ideas. It's another thing you don't want to talk about in public, Tim. Got it. Yes, sir. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Trust me. It's a tremendous benefit. Let me just say. Mm -hmm. Curbside, yeah. yeah. Even in this area. I'll just call it single payer trash. Yeah. <laughs> or we just stay away from that too. Yeah, I don't know. You're treading on a thin ice there. Okay. We're <laughs> <laughs> gonna have to have lunch. We'll go over all this stuff. All right. So in terms of the uh, 910 employee benefits and insurance, are we kind of at the final number for health insurance at this point? We think premiums. we think that is a good number to go forward with. Interesting meeting. <laughs> good, said we're an interesting meeting. Good viewing. <laughs> like, really not Spectator right? sport. Well, I think Game of Thrones was last night, so people need a little break. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> or two nights ago. Two nights, yeah. I'm not a, a follower. Those are all my questions. Or I'm kind of done with the overall budget because we, the other ones we had, you know, the representatives yeah. come yeah. in. So to think about the impact of growth, schools we know came in at what is it here? Um, six. Six point six. I think fire and police were around eight and nine. Um, Again, thinking of those areas that are directly impacted. DPW, he came in below, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, at least a, for the, a little not below. The water, there's, so, yeah. There's uh,
Well, I misspoke. Fire says here it's only 1.96%. You know, that's because we took the... Uh, what, the three FTEs out? Yeah, we, okay. we, we put the three FTEs elsewhere. Okay. Pending the grant application. Mm -hmm. I think you heard from Dave Del Torrio about the utilities, which is one of our challenge areas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I think you've been through all the capital articles with everybody who had an interest in them. Has the CIC reviewed the ones that they hadn't reviewed? We have a couple here that are pending here. Uh, yes, they have. Okay. Um, they endorsed. Have been reviewed endorsed and endorsed. Everything. Correct. Everything that was unendorsed. Correct. Okay. So I'm sure it says in the in the um, appropriation committee report, but how much is debt contributing to the overall versus the operating budget? So, so the the right. Let's yeah. talk. Okay. Let's talk about debt. There's uh, if you look at the sources and uses presentation, the alternative one. I think that's the one that kind of pulls the debt out as a use. So we're on page 12 of the appropriations report and it shows that debt and interest would be 8.4 million next year compared to 9.5 this year so debt and interest go down about 900,000 our discussion tonight has kind of uh, reminded me that some of that debt is reimbursable and we should figure out a way to present that but we're talking basically about spending 90 million dollars and 8.4 of its debt uh, so that's about 9.4 percent. I'm, I'm not following. Are you on this? This, yeah, that yeah. page. So if you look at the debt service number, yeah. repayment of town debt and interest on the uses section. Oh, uses. Okay. At 700. Or are you looking on the? This is the appropriations committee report. And so some debt has been paid off between 19 and 20 and uh, we have you know and that graph shows later on but we have 8.4 million in debt service debt and interest and that's a combined excluded debt and uh, in debt that's subject to the two and a half cap because this presentation isn't about the tax cap it's about really what are you spending your money on mm -hmm. do you care whether that five dollars coming out of your pocket is excluded debt or not it's really the tax bill. Mm -hmm. where, where are you spending it? And so also, this shows. Also, just to clarify that, Tim. Yeah, please. So that that that, that service also includes other other funds. So that's the CPC is included, and the enterprise funds. Oh, okay. So those those aren't tax impacting. Yep. That's why the number seems to be appear to be different. Is because we're including that those debts in that. So we get the, the revenue in for those from those funds and we pay them out of those funds. Yeah, so there's a couple, there are probably a couple things then that uh, impact that, the reimbursement from the schools and then the re enterprise funds. Right. Okay. And what's, um, I know it's in here. I remember reading it. I probably commented on it. What's um, uh, CPC's debt service compared to what their projected yeah, we, had that. We, we were just talking today about getting that line put in. The CPC's debt service is on page 21, and it looks like their debt service is about 210000 I don't have the data table there yet. They're uh, probably going to collect around $1.1 something like that? Yes. 
1.3 is the estimate right but in reality they'll it'll be 1.3 because we do this if we the do match. conservative right and and the the match is always it's going progressively getting lower and lower yeah. because of Boston coming on yeah and other communities and that's just reason it does not include the um, the turf fields because not yet technically been borrowed so we'll be adding that I saw your comment we'll be adding that to the um, uh, authorized but not yet issued um, okay. line on the graph okay and so that and that'll hit them next year or I, the sum, yeah, well, the, right. So the short-term debt um, <clears throat> next year and the long-term debt the following year because it'll be a, a, a short-term borrowing. Um, okay, we'll roll into a, a longer-term note. All right, and that was what was that seven hundred thousand or three hundred thousand? I believe it was seven hundred thousand. So I can go back and. Verify. And then what about and then um, they were also authorized for um, I believe it was a loan for lights at Fruit Street. Was that another 600000 Correct. And it's my understanding that work has not been done. Um, I think Jay spoke to that a little bit. They were having some trouble with that. Yeah, they were talking about the cost of bringing power out there. Correct. But it's, it's money that's authorized that would end up being a loan. It would be more. Co than, correct. So. Yeah, exactly. If they were moving forward with the project. So that's a total of $1.3 million uh, possible correct. addition. Yep. Okay. So, but that's not the, that wouldn't be the debt service. That would be the debt load. Basically, right. Correct. correct. Um, okay, so that would. So it would actually be a little bit more if it's long term because of the print uh, interest that's involved. Yeah. So it's it's running between it's running between two point seven and three percent right now. Okay. So but the annual obligation would be, you know, some small fraction. These, so. these because the the life is I believe that fields of fifteen mm -hmm. years. Okay. Max, and I think the lighting would be that max. Okay. So depend upon how we can work that load into. So it might be around um, sixty to seventy thousand on one, and something okay. Like that. Mm -hmm. So so it ended up probably be about another one hundred and twenty thousand onto the onto the debt service. Okay. Are you talking about that's going to be two thousand twenty or two thousand twenty one? Well, my part of twenty uh, and part and of then 20. and then. Full bore in 21. Okay. So we, you know, we have those other lines showing the projected but not issued for the water fund and for the general fund, and we're going to put that on tomorrow for the uh, CPA fund. Be great. Just we're talking about that this afternoon. So good catch. Good catch on that. So we're going to need to firm up some language at the end of the introduction talking about your actual recommendation when you decide what you want to do for that. And uh, if there's other points you want to get into the report and you want to uh, send them to us, we'll get, we'll get whatever comments you have in there. One thing Maybe I want to though, rather than just send them without having the committee discuss them, discuss them first. I feel like that's going to be more representative of what the committee is actually thinking for the for the narrative. Yes. Particular, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think discussing them and mm -hmm. fleshing out some position would be better than having people send opposing comments. In. Right. Exactly. Because whatever Todd says, I'll say I'll, the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> I, we do have one more piece of information I'll share with you now, and uh, we were talking about the impact of the underwrite at the last meeting, and uh, I misspoke, and so Dave, I have asked Dave to prepare a sheet showing what the projections look like for 2021 if the underwrite passes, and that's uh, really no under. We haven't put it in because it hasn't passed, but no underrides have failed yet so it's probably worth understanding what the impact is do you want to pass those sheets down 
and, and the way this changes is in years 21 and 22, the top line levy base goes down and it creates more pressure on the bottom to balance the budget. Uh, by the complete underwrite of the 1.18 million shown uh, shown in 2020. So thanks. So if you look at the box, the uh, center column that has the box around it, the one, two, three, the fifth number down shows the underwrite of the 1.180568 million. And then what that does is create a new top line on 2021 that, com that creates pressure on the whole funding source for 21 and it flows through to 22. So if you compare that to your, the, the version we're working with in which the underwrite has not occurred, you can see that change. So the bottom, it shows a shortfall of $433,000? Yes. And that's with all the uh, funding assumptions. You can see them down here on the right-hand side. That general government will go up 2.5%, that the schools will go up 5%, that employee benefits will go up 6%. So uh, with this underwrite, our challenge will be in subsequent year to look in there to find that money and uh, look in those places to find those opportunities. Depending upon what the tax impact is that the Board of Selectmen want to endorse and accept. So the assumption of the schools at 5% in 2021, is that an agreement with the school department or that's just an assumption they couldn't even hit 6.5% this year? So um, when, I, when I put these numbers together, it was to try to make it look as though I were, I was not trying to cook the numbers to make it all balanced, because I could do that. I can make it all balanced <laughs> in a second. It's yeah. increased the free cash coming so into the year. What I'm trying to do is keep <laughs> it as close other to the receipts. Year. So I, I lowered the overall um, percentage impact by one, per, one full percent from expectations last year because this year they were they were there was expansion issues so I kind of try to level it off a little bit that's not to say that there isn't room in there I just don't know that right now and I didn't want to present an unfair position so again stacks of estimates building this thing up one of the estimates is that growth is going to slow down so that could mean that cost growth would slow down to some mm -hmm. degree to the extent that there's a correlation between population growth and cost growth in the schools is where you typically see that argument made the most. Uh, and, then all, and then there's an assumption about what the selectmen are going to endorse in terms of uh, tax impact. And we don't know what, what that will be. Uh, and there are assumptions about other receipts. And then there's assumptions about benefit increased growth. I mean, there's a lot of uh, assumptions that every year you go out into the future, they become hazier and they're represented as a, as a point estimate, but really it's a widening cone of uncertainty as you get further years out, right? And they're represented by a single set of assumptions on the page. So I just wanted to share that because I think I, I had uh, uh, miscommunicated what the impact would be in as soon as 21. So I just wanted to get that out there. Yeah, you know, and I think that, um, I think that there is eventually um, a, a tipping point with the underrides. As you mentioned, you know, there's already been a couple that have been passed in town. Um, this one, if it's presented, um, you know, if I had $10 to bet, I'd probably bet that it will pass. Um, and, you know, eventually there's going to be a point where we either need to um, start cutting things that we don't necessarily want to cut or present a compelling argument to town meeting and the voters uh, to pass an override. 
And I look at the other side of the coin, though, and I look at if the underrides had not been passed uh, in these prior years. And I think that the town's been uh, very fiscally conservative. Uh, I think that Norman has, and, and our school administrations have done an incredible job at uh, keeping things tight, and that has brought us, you know, free cash from one year into another. It's given us excess tax levy, um, unused tax levy that's uh, come from one year to another. Um, and I always go back to one of the reasons that um, that our, our board of selectmen had initially started talking about an underride. I think it was about six or seven years ago now, uh, was because it brought more transparency to the process to the typical town meeting member and the typical voter. Um, and when that unused levy keeps piling on and, you know, you've got two million, then you've got three million, and then if you don't pass an underwrite, you're going to have, you know, let's say five million. It gets to the point where, um, un unbeknownst to the typical voter, a budget can pass that has much more than a two and a half percent impact on their tax bill. Uh, I think at one point we were up in the 10 to 12 percent range that wouldn't require an override. Um, if we had been compounding those without any underrides, I don't know, you could easily do the math, you have all the numbers, you know, we're probably in up around a 20 percent area, at least 15 percent area by now. Um, and I don't think that that's what the taxpayer expects. And I think that to inject something that possibly creates an additional, you know, level of complication and an additional vote, but nonetheless creates discussion around what we're spending our money on, I think that's well worth it. What's, so, what's, what has been our increase even for the past, like, five years? It's on the Appropriations Committee report page. Oh, how helpful. That handy little... <laughs> Report. This is actually Mike's graph uh, that shows both the tax impact and inflation. It's page 17. <laughs> and the one on the left is the tax impact. So, I, you know, I think our view is that this is a policy decision and uh, the elected and appointed boards uh, meet and discuss and debate it and develop a position and our job is to execute is to facilitate the discussion with good information and to execute the decision and we're trying to fulfill that role I'll also just add that the more the more of that unused levy that we have on the table, I know that there's a um, uh, pretty widespread perception that it uh, weakens the taxpayer's position uh, in, in bargaining. In the what? I'm sorry. In bargaining, I think there's there's a pretty widespread perception that uh, having a lot of extra levy capacity uh, weakens the taxpayer's uh, position in, in bargaining. Collective bargaining. Here's it. What so, does, what does the underwrite um, do to financial ratings? Or is that that's something? Oh, this on the page there. It's on. That's that's what it is. So the page, the the written page that you have right in front of you there is has the underwrite in it and it shows up in this right. column. No, I'm sorry, I mean the financial ratings uh, it's like the bond she wants to know triple A bond ratings. Oh it's yeah. uh, unclear. Yeah, it's, we've had people tell us both things, honestly. That's what, and, we heard and that's the what's in the paper. Yeah. And and uh, yeah. you know there are lenders who think that the so, some people think that lenders are most concerned with the 
absolutely unfettered ability to raise money and pay bills, and other people think the lenders are interested in fiscal discipline. And those two things are kind of at odds in this particular, particular case. Uh, you know, and it may be that there's some of both and they're offsetting. And really, for any lender, it's the ability to repay. Mm -hmm. That's what all lenders care about, is the ability to repay. And our town has the ability to repay anything we borrow. So uh, we, we do not have the challenge that many communities have, so. Right, it's the ability to pay, not the ability to spend. And so, right. so yeah. Yeah. looking at this underwrite, if I had to kind of forecast how I think it would play out, it would be that, and looking at the debt load, which is where some flexibility occurs in the out years, mm -hmm. virtually every large thing that we buy in the coming years is going to have to be purchased with an override, which is, in a, which, or be excluded debt, to be excluded debt, which is another control. And as you speak about inserting and infusing more controls into the process, that seems to be where the, this additional underwrite walks us to if there is going to be another school, it's definitely going to be uh, excluded debt to get there. And if there is going to be uh, any new large facility, it's going to be excluded debt to get there. And that creates another level of approval and another level of review. And uh, I'll, I'll also say that the very first underwrite I thought was going to do the same, and it didn't. <laughs> well, I, there's been some excluded debt, so are you sure it didn't? Well, yeah, there has been some excluded debt. You're absolutely right. But we've never gotten to a point where we, um, you know, required the underwrite. The excluded debt, though, is, yeah, right. right. I think that creates some work. slack in the system, I guess is my point, yeah. that, that uh, yeah, when it's something that's, that's outside the operational component, right? And yeah, so does I think the excluded debt cost us more? No, no, and it comes out of the same taxpayer pocket, so it, it's still impact, but it's impact in which the voter has elected to specifically do that in a layer even beyond the already pretty inclusive method of the town meeting in the annual budget, right? So it's. It's yet another hurdle mm -hmm. for self-taxing. I was actually always a, I'm a fan of the excluded debt just because it ends up requiring a ballot vote. Right. So you, you know you have 150 people show up at town meeting. You know you can if there's something that a special interest likes, they can pass anything. But right. in that extra check at the at the ballot, I think if people can think about it, or you actually you'll have more people voting and deciding. So that pretty much at town meeting, almost everything will pass. Yeah. And you really want to be sure that this is what the people want. So we have a, a fire truck for a million two in this year. I mean, that three years from now might be an excluded debt vote rather than a town meeting article. And then you'll find out if the, we, you know, we'll go down that road. That would be both. It'd be town meeting and then the ballot. Yeah. yeah. And historically, anything that was like 500,000 or more, we did use as excluded debt. Mm -hmm the big items. Now I notice here, just because we're talking about the OPEC trust is only funded at 500 for the next two years in this. Yeah, th again, Dave just did this today and uh, we wanted to try to present a, a straight crosswalk. Uh, yeah. So. So and there would I was concerned. <laughs> there would have to be down from six twenty five. And there would have to be more adjustments like that. And and those would be the kind of adjustments that people would be looking at. Mm -hmm. So but usually we we had although I'd like to see it in the operation operational budget, it usually is does end up being free cash that we use. If we have free cash for it, mm -hmm. we fund it. Right. And that's why that should be in the operational budget, right? Make its way in there. So yeah. it becomes an automatic thing. Uh, year over year, and that's that's really one of the arguments against uh, trying to grind the free cash down to a very low level. Yeah. Is we're using that for actually a program now for uh, modest level capital needs that we fund f within a single year, and so hmm. how are we going to fund that program absent the free cash? So we we basically use our budgetary surplus for that. And if we had no free cash, we could find ourselves in a, a place with nine-year-old police cars and 
37-year-old mm -hmm. fire truck. So we well, we'd have to come I up mean, with another method. Yeah. We better start buying Mercedes now instead of last. It's a CD player. That was Colorado, and you know, that's a whole different state. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to see in the uh, message that this is the first year that we're, that at least that I've been on it, that we're using free cash to pay part of the operational expenses, part of the operational budget, mm -hmm. which should be a concern. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Yeah. Okay, we'll draft some language and include it there, and you can edit it. Yeah. If that's, do I hear everybody? I thought I heard everybody assent mm -hmm. there. Uh, Mr. Chair, anything about, uh, I know last year, I'm pretty sure last year, um, this committee was making recommendations around some of those recurring costs, like the police cruisers. This year there was an attempt to put it into the operational budget, and then it was pulled out. I know that we can have the philosophical discussions around, you know, free cash versus operational budget and all that, but I don't know if that's a point that... Um, anybody's interested in as well. I mean, I do believe those items should make their way into the operational budget because once it's there, then you won't have to, see, justify it because if you budget every year to at least at least two cruisers, police cruisers, then it's, it's in the budget year over year. Mm -hmm. um, on mm -hmm. the other hand, because it's a capital expense, if we don't have the funds, we can say, well, maybe you're going to have to have a slightly, you, you know, older mm -hmm. cruiser. We can only do two, we can't do three. So it gives you, it gives, does give you a little more flexibility in the budget. So to me, it goes both ways. Um, when Could you, always be a DPW vehicles or yeah. police cruisers. And Could always be a minimum number in the operational budget, and then if they feel they need extras that year, you know, whether it's because of increased staffing or something happening with one or two of the cruisers. Um, I remember the last few years, you know, the chief was always coming and asking for three, and we always managed to find them two. <laughs> um, so, I don't know. Just, to, just something to think about. Um, I, I would... I, I do think that uh, whether it's through a recommendation for this year's budget or just a recommendation in general, um, you know, the, the 625, 625 plus the 3% each year for OPEB, um, I mean, I think that we should be backing that. Um, if, if we're going to make a recommendation for a change this year, um, I, could, I could get behind uh, asking for more for that as long as it's offset by something else in the operational budget. So no net impact. Exactly. Do we have, I do think do it's we the have right recommendations for the offset? Hmm? Do we have recommendations for the offset? I do. I mean, I'm not sure that'll be... I do. I have a recommendation that uh, we ask the Board of Selectmen to direct the town manager and finance committee to uh, finance group to uh, find two hundred and twenty five thousand dollars from somewhere <laughs> seriously <laughs> life is a circle that's all i'm going to say <laughs> so so just to be clear is that those particular things are being funded through free cash right now they're not in the operational budget but that that is the point so so finding that no impact doesn't exist right now because it's not being funded from from that process. It's being so it doesn't impact the 2.5. Is that what you're saying? It doesn't impact the so the the 625 or the right. OPEB and the, and the stable data funds have been whenever we've been funding them have been funded to uh, free cash. Right. So I think the point that Todd is making that we're using 200 and some odd thousand dollars of free cash for the operational budget. So if we find something in the operational budget, at least we can. Mm -hmm. But but does it, but are you saying that if we were to add the 225, it's going to impact that 2.5%? I'm not sure if I'm following. So, if, so 
Or if we take uh, it out of free again, time. it's it's a, it's well, a game of, of of realizing all the sources that we can apply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and seeing how we can fund it. Right, and I'm not I'm not saying that you're gonna come up with new you know fresh money and start oh, yeah. printing off the press. So, so the you know, it's got to affect something else. There's something else that's being funded that. You know, we would have to say, okay, we're not going to fund that. And that something else is that list of capital pay as you go items because that's where the free cash is going to be spent on. So if we want more free cash, we would stop doing some of those things, some combination of the things on that list. I mean, that would be the logical place to look. What is our free cash estimate after we? So we have 3.2 million in free cash right now, and we're estimating we're going to spend 2.23. Did I get those numbers right? Uh, yes, but so if you go to page three of that, that document that Tim shared, there there are some uses in FY19, um, so the supplemental bills that were approved at, at annual town meeting, um, the Lake Maspinock, um Dam, yep. the fire communication system, the snow and ice deficit. So the free cash is 3.2, and then when you take those other items off, it's it's 2.23. That's available. We, we already spent that at the special town meeting, right? Exactly. Yep. Okay. No. So we've used all of the free cash. That's the question, yeah. Okay. yeah. We've used all of the free cash from last year. It's okay. already incorporated into, into this all in, the yep. in, Really, in the pay-as-you-go is how the last of it gets spent. That's correct. On page 18 of mm -hmm. the, the document. And, the and if we just... So that's actually buying things, like uh, the uh, the... School capacity study, the data center replacement for both the school and the and the town, the boiler replacement. I mean, so that's the that's the challenge you have is you're further bolstering your long term standing in the reserve, which I'm in favor of. But if the method is to do it by deferring maintenance on things like boilers. You know that's uh, that's a choice. So another option is just to ask to increase the budget amount by two hundred twenty-five thousand. But I don't think the board of selectmen will go for that, and I think they'll say, "What is the offset?" Unless our message is that we really need yeah. don't offer to make those changes, but we're, again, we're kicking the can, you know, especially on the the OPEB. That even yeah. in, in future modeling, it, it's not even in there at the full funding for the next two fiscal years. So, the, we I mean, the, the two point five. Yeah, and my contention is just that we we said last year you're not funding it correctly. It did get funded again this year. I don't know when we're supposed to put the input into the budget. The two point five percent was kind of a an arbitrary number they came up with. Um, and again, it's not it's not worth going into a huge fight, but I just. I don't know when we're supposed to give the input and, and ask them to do this. It's two years now that we haven't funded it, but the Appropriations Committee is recommending we fund it at. And again, it's good times. I have to be said to, to fund it more. Um, the money, because we've been conservative, you know, may actually just kind of be there um, when it comes time to, to set the tax rates and whatnot. I mean, we can go over the positions that are being added, and, you know, because we didn't speak to the Board of Health. Why? Why do they need a public health nurse? Public health nurse. What are the um, What are the regulations around uh, snow and ice? And the, you know, we have to reasonably fund it within the operational budget. That's the three hundred and fifty. So now we have the seven hundred and forty-two. Um, I guess what are the regulations around around uh, that as a as a debt? So you're asking about a floor. What would a floor be for that? Is that uh, so it's, you have so in order the this is one of the legal deficits that you can carry mm -hmm. from year to year. Mm -hmm. um, in order to be eligible to carry it as a deficit, you have to at least have funded it what you previously funded. For the previous year. Yep. Okay. You can't dip below that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so and so once you increase it, 
you know, as a, as a beginning operating budget for the year, yep. you're stuck. Okay. Okay. Um, the problem is that it becomes, if you don't offset it by using free cash or some other leftover thing and you carry it, it, it has the same impact as excluded debt. It goes right to the top of our tax impact mm -hmm. list and hits the taxpayers. You have to cover that okay. particular deficit. So even if we don't have the money to cover it, it's, it'll be it'll lessen the available amount of money next year. Okay. Do you say that had to be that's excluded from prop two and a half? Or if if uh, you don't if you don't if you don't have the free cash to cover it, it has to be in the operational budget, but can it be excluded from prop two and a half? Um, it is excluding any deficit, any any deficit that exists in your in your operating budget it needs to be raised in the next fiscal year. So it'll be part of the next year's tax. Okay. So it'll immediately go to the top and it'll be it'll be, you know, less whatever our capacity is to Okay, so it is within the um, prop two and a half. Right. The um, $235,000 for the stormwater management, mm -hmm. is that uh, is that a state mandate? I believe it is. I think that's part of the I believe requirement so. for DPW. I think every year there's a certain amount. I don't know if it's analysis, if, if it's water and you know, storm water analysis, or it's to do certain work on the storm drains that yeah, that's mandated. I remember mandated. There, there was something that was coming through. It was about um, uh, um, I think it was cleaning a lot of the the storm drains, and that was going to be mandated. But they also kept pushing that off and pushing that off. Um, so I'm not sure if it's finally a mandate now and that's what this number is or, or what. And our current stabilization fund without this 208,000, what are we, what are we at for a percentage? What is 3.4 of 4.1? Is that .4. Did you put that five percent? One in nine. Three point four or four point one is where we are. No, we're at three point four. Yes. We should be at four point one. Right. So we're at three point four or four point one, which still is have, we still have whatever income. 68, 70. We can earn through the end of this fiscal year. Right, and we're having some growth in that fund. That's right. Yeah. So I just. So you. As of March 31st, I guess that's a. If I had a calculator. And this 200,000 200, represents about a quarter of a percent for us to add on. So we're at 83% of where we should be 84% as of the end of March in that fund of the recommended level. And another 200 would be another 5%. So that 200 is gonna take us from 84 to 89% funding not counting any growth that may occur during that period. Okay. Does that sound about right? Yeah. Okay. What are some examples of typical things that that would be used for? I think you'd that use the well, rainy day fund. Yeah, you yeah. can use it for anything. So, so that could be. How many prior year bills is a lot of that they, they a lot of other communities would use that fund for. Mm -hmm. So let's say you lost your largest employer and personal property taxpayer and there were all kinds of negative consequences that happened from that. 
you know, the old Dexter Shoe Company closing, that kind of thing. That helps you uh, not have to pivot on a dime the day the doors close. Mm -hmm. we, we tapped into that um, after the, the crash in 2010, I think. We were tapping into it um, when we were having zero or one percent budget increases. So, um, and I think it was just... I don't know. I think it was just going towards the operating fund, quite honestly. I, I'm not sure how we were using it, but um, mm -hmm. that's when we tapped into it, which is why I feel like we need to fund it because <laughs> it was painful to tap into it and, and a lot of controversy. But um, and it wasn't. I don't think it was at nearly five million at that point. What I would actually rather see is that we have three hundred some odd thousand in our capital stabilization fund. And which is basically we funded it like one or two years and that was it. I would rather see us deplete that and use it for something because essentially what we don't really have anything in mind what that is for. At, at least I'm under the impression. So deplete that for something in the capital projects and use that to fund the OPEP at mm -hmm. this point because yeah. if, if for instead of saying let's not contribute, I think the stabilization fund you don't contribute anything. Then our overall budget goes up. Now yep. you're now you're even though you, you didn't take any out, now you're behind even more because right. the operational budget. But the capital stabilization is is what exactly is that? Yeah, I would agree with that. Actually. Mm -hmm. If that was going to be the philosophy right, or or what you were kind of thinking, I'm just throwing stuff around for discussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say, I, I would just throw out an idea, and I'm thinking about external people looking at us, bond raters, you know, board, uh, uh, lenders, to use stabilization money in a time as good as this mm -hmm. is yeah. perhaps more egregious than not funding stabilization during good times. I mean, 54% 54, 54 of our new costs are going to be funded from new growth. This is a we are in a growth posture. Mm -hmm. So I don't know about the signaling of drawing down stabilization to, to, raise a, to raise a different stabilization. I don't know that. Well, the whole purpose, when, uh, you know, I was on the committee when we first started the capital stabilization fund and saying, right. gee, instead of borrowing, because every time we bought a truck, we were borrow doing short-term borrowing on everything. We didn't have the free cash. Right. So we're saying if we just had a capital stabilization fund, we could always use that. Yeah. If the intent was basically to instead. deplete it and then no longer fund it, then I can see that. Um, I see what you're saying, though. If it's a you know, message, yeah. You're, hmm? you're, you'd basically be taking money out of one stabilization fund to put it in a longer-term liability fund. Is is the kind of pasture you would be doing? In. But the original intent of the capital stabilization fund, I think, has kind of been lost over the last eight or nine years. You, or you could say instead of, you know, it would be instead of borrowing $1.2 million for the fire truck you apply, you know, that that kind of saves over the longer term. And that was the intent, you know, for mm -hmm. those kind of purposes. So you wouldn't have to borrow $1.2 million for, yeah. uh, for the fire truck, which you'll, although interest rates are kind of, they're still low compared to where they were 10, 10 12 years ago. And so borrowing is not the worst thing just because interest rates aren't as high as they used to be. I think we have you know, our meetings going on two hours here. Yeah. Um, I think we have a couple of themes here to think about. Thursday is our public hearing mm -hmm. and I don't want to spend two hours after the public hearing debating because I think we do have to start our motions okay. um, on Thursday. I don't want to start them now. At okay. This point. Great. It's, unless we want to have a marathon Not tonight. session <laughs> marathon. <laughs> Post marathon <laughs> marathon. Oh, there we go. Uh, I think that'll, that'll work fine. 
So um, if, I, if I could, I, I handed out uh, a draft of the Warren Articles and motions. Um, I marked everything with an R that the committee has to um, take a position on, and an M with everything that the committee will um, sponsor the motion on. Um, I also started a draft on another sheet of paper, um, just drafts what the motions would look like um, for your consideration for when we do get to that point of, of making that, when you get to that point of making that vote, um, just for informational purposes. Great. So, Ben, the R's are? Uh, making a recommendation. Um, so there are 30 of those, and, and 20 of them, the, the um, Appropriations Committee will be um, sponsoring the motion or making the motion. Do you want a brief rundown of the BRAVE Acts, or do you want to wait for the next thing for that? Is it just, is it keeping you up? If, Can you read? If we could, if we could do it in, you know, five or ten minutes. I think, we, we, I think we can, if you. Okay interested in it so using Ben's document as the guide it would be Ben's page four Ben's page three probably so on page three the one on the bottom it says personal property tax exemption and that's actually an error it's it's real property tax exemption that there is no personal property tax exemption so we're going to remove the word personal in that because otherwise it's it's uh, says the wrong thing uh, and so that's all the different exemptions that people get and we had uh, a little analysis document that I saw passing through my office this morning and I don't have a copy of it with me that has the impact of that and I'll bring the dollar impact at the next meeting but it's a small amount of impact. I think we've had this one on yeah. the warrant every year. Every year. Yes. The next one on the top, the first Brave Act one on the top of the next page. So it's on page four, and I guess they're still not numbered, but it's the top one. Increase the abatement amount, not to exceed the cost of living. And that is an error where it says in the last clause of that, and to establish the amount of increases in all fit fiscal years uh, so we think that's that's not that last clause goes it is to link it to CPI and, and to have that happen and we calculated that with the number of people who get those abatements now the inflation adjustment was going to be under a hundred dollars so the okay can, can you give us more background because I absolutely have no clue what the brave act is Okay, uh, so provides that now. So there are exemptions. Uh, there are, and again, I should have had that page with me. There's there are modest exemptions to property taxes for certain categories of veterans. Mm -hmm. So a disabled veteran, a seventy percent disabled veteran might be entitled to a thousand dollar tax exemption okay. a widow uh, a purple heart recipient uh, there are categories of people and I'll bring those categories uh, next time uh, and this would give COLA to those exemptions so they're not staying at the thousand dollars forever okay the next brave act exemption is you can only get the exemption above if you are the homeowner so if you're the veteran and you own the home you get the exemption there are apparently some small number of veterans who have their homes titled in trusts and this would allow them to still get the exemption if their home is titled in a trust because those people are not eligible to get the exemption uh, under the current rule so we don't know how many veterans there are who would be eligible uh, to, who, who have their homes titled in a trust, who would be eligible for this modest exemption, uh, and whatever the, the cost would be, the multiple of however many people it was, but a, a nominal amount of people for, for the exemption. The next one on the top of page five is the largest one and we don't know if we have any of these cases. And it would be a complete tax exemption from property tax for Gold Star parents who have lost a child in combat. 
So I don't know if the number would be zero or one or two for our town, but for those people, they would receive a complete tax exemption. So a very small number of people, perhaps none, uh, but a total benefit, a complete benefit. It's not a partial exemption. And the final one is to add veterans as a class of people with the, I won't say the elderly because I think I'm eligible, but with people over 60 who are allowed to do tax work off. So this would allow veterans who are 41 or 53 or 39 or 28 to come in and work off up to $1,500 of their property tax bill. Uh, and again, we don't, the, the cap would be $1,500. We don't know if four people will take advantage of it or seven or nine or zero. Uh, but the impact to the tax pool, I mean, if it were nine, it would be $14,000 for that provision. Uh, you know, the previous provision, the average tax bill is $12,000. So if we have two parents who have lost children in combat, that would cost us $25,000 in the tax pool. And then going back, uh, if there's one or two veterans who would be eligible uh, because their house is in a trust for an exemption because they're a disabled veteran or a, a wounded veteran, not just a veteran, uh, that would be a few thousand dollars more. And then the cost of living, the pool that we spend is pretty low. And you're talking about a couple of percent on a fairly low pool. So in the hundreds of dollars for that. So I think if we, have, if we have no Gold Star parents, the whole bill for the whole thing could be under $20,000. If we have a, a, some Gold Star parents who would benefit from this, then uh, depending on how, what their houses are and how many there are, that would be the expensive provision. And uh, that's, the, that's the Brave Act. Thank you. These are not all veterans of any, any, any veteran, regardless yeah. of when they served, where they served. You have to. There, are, there are criteria for the, for qualification, and uh, it's not any veteran. It's a disabled veteran. Okay. Uh, so. And the gold star. And then there are. Is, yeah. And it, so go, I'm sorry. sorry. So that means questions. child killed and your child right. is killed and why right. do. So this provision exists now for spouses. Mm -hmm. So if you lose your spouse, you are exempt from property tax while you remain unmarried. Uh, and this would extend that same very. Uh, I, I just can't call it a generous benefit. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a, that same recognition to the parents right. of a veteran. Yep. And, uh, so we looked at the cost impacts. The cost impacts are low, and I will give you a little chart of the qualifications. So who brought this to the warrant? Or the so this is a, a statute that passed the state legislature, and then it was forwarded to the assessors, and the assessors endorse it. Uh, staff brought it forward, so I think officially it's going to be recommended by staff, uh, probably myself. And it may be myself and the assessors. I think the lawyers looking at whether they can do that in a compliant way. Because we make, we'll make the motion on this particular article, right? It says motion. It says motion for the Brave Act. So okay. according so, to so I'm, Mr. I'll, Sweeney, I'll, this be I'd probably be asking if someone's going to say exactly. Well, who gets? I think the first one there, who, who gets this benefit. Right. Someone, I, I would expect someone else to know exactly yeah. who is. That, the information is totally known, <coughs> and I will have a fact sheet for you by our next meeting. OK. Because usually when you're talking about the property tax exemption, I think um, the tax assessor right. would, would step up and, and kind of explain exactly who gets sure. the ex the, the exemption there because there are yes so it's, it's a year over year thing that every year somebody asks well who, what exactly is this and, right and yeah, you know we've just put together a little booklet to help people understand this yeah. maze of benefits that are available okay. and so that's why I know as much as I know because I worked on editing that booklet 
Okay. But I just don't want to speak to it from memory. Okay. It'll actually be more so clear because we have the appropriation committee handout, which will explain every article. So it would be good to get that information there. Yeah. The the um, the benefit brochure you're talking about is is it go beyond Brayback? Is it? It does. Close? It goes to the see all the senior. Uh, yeah because there are different income thresholds so what we're really trying to do is take a, get to like a questionnaire format where like a, a turbo tax where we'd ask you is your income above this but below this and do you have this status are you over this age do you have some of them have asset tests mm -hmm. some of them have income tests some of them have age tests Honestly, the only thing I've ever seen more complicated is fisheries enforcement, mm -hmm. where it's species, size, gear, and season. And this is the same kind of thing, where there's every dimension of qualification is different. So, and then people get lost in the maze, so we're trying to come up with a, a list of questions that will then steer people to what they're eligible for. So often people don't, until till it's too late, till they've they're out of money and they don't realize they mm -hmm have the uh, opportunity to avail themselves of these benefits. Yeah. And then there's no going back. So we really want to, if we're going to have these and they're in law and some people are getting them, we want everyone to know about them. Do we do the ones where the seniors can um, not pay taxes and a lien goes against the house until they sell that, the house? That's another program where, where the, uh, it's a uh, tax deferral program. Yeah. So, yeah, and that's, that's in there. All these things to try to, uh, you know, and we hear this from the selectmen a lot and at working near the front desk downstairs where people come to pay their bills. Uh, there's a high sensitivity to try to help people stay in their homes who want to stay in their homes, who've contributed for 40 years and we're doing everything we can within uh, the rules and to, to reach out and uh, provide the information people need to try to stay in, stay in their homes. So I think the tax uh, deferral is half. You can defer up to half, mm -hmm. which is quite a, can, can help people quite well. Exactly. And what it means is when you ultimately uh, transfer your house mm -hmm. by moving or when you leave it, it, that bill just accrues to that. Right. <clears throat> Particularly here where the houses have um, expanded for people who have been here for a long time, their, their values have right. geometrically uh, <laughs> yes. increased. We don't, um, we don't often deal with uh, TIFs in town, but you know, I think that when we do, when we're you know, talking to these new companies, one of the things that we should be considering is having some fund uh, that they're contributing to, you know, instead of, instead of um, uh, giving them X amount of relief for taxes, uh, have it be X, you know, times 0.75, uh, but that other 0.25 goes into this into this fund to help, you know, whether it's elders or veterans or whomever uh, with their taxes. So that's an interesting idea, and we'll look at that. I mean, you know, we have the unified rate here, and so we don't even uh, charge different rates between residential, commercial, and industrial, and and uh, we'd have to see what's statutorily authorized, whether that's... Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah, just an idea you're throwing out. I, I get it. It's, it's, uh, and we're looking for ways to, to do I mean, that. you know, we have these other programs where people can volunteer and, and this and that. And we've got, you know, we used to, uh, you know, send out something with your taxes, you know, saying, you know, do you want to contribute right. to help out in this pool? And it would be adding to a pool like that. Right. Absolutely. So that would be more like the, the uh, I don't know if it would be so much a TIF as the development agreements we have, the host community agreements where we get benefits, like we get people to commit to build a park or build sidewalks or to buy open space elsewhere in the town. Maybe that's the... the yeah, I don't know what it would be called. I mean, I see it as part of, you know, that whole tax incentive piece. Right. Um, but in the end, I think that it just benefits everybody you know I mean obviously it, it benefits the person that it's helping stay in their house it's benefiting the business because you know they're doing this great thing for the community and I think that it's uh, you know it's a good thing for the for the town as the government as well okay if there is the you know the statute I think everyone in town wants to help 
people in need. Mm -hmm. But we also don't want to be a perception that we're that we're you know given all the money or given a benefit to only one individual. Mm -hmm. You know, there could be other people in town that aren't you know of age per se, but would require help, some sort of help. So maybe that would be more of a way to put money aside and have an ability to help people that all the people that need help. Right. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Ready to adjourn? I'll move to adjourn. Second. All right. All those in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Four zero motion carries. Thank you. Thanks. See you Thursday. See you Thursday night.